bensound.com. You are joining with audiences from across the globe to enjoy Harrogate International Festival's series of online events. Stream straight from our home to yours. Sit back, relax, and enjoy an interview with Mark Billingham, celebrating 20 years of Thorn as part of the Theakston Old Peculiar Crime Writing Festival. Sponsored by the Crime Vault. We promise you've got the best seats in the house. Hello, I'm Joe Haddo, and him over there is the international best-selling author, Mark Billingham. Hello. Hello, Joe. How are you? I'm very well. It's Good. lovely to Good. see you after a long old time. Yes. Uh, because I feel like by now, under normal circumstances, we probably would have run into each other several times this year already, wouldn't we? Yes, yes, we would. And, uh, and certainly were this at the Harrogate Festival not happening online, but in... In reality, uh, we would have had several drinks by now, I'm sure. And we, <laughs> and we first met at the Harrogate Festival, of course. So Yes, we did. We did, did. indeed. Yeah. Which, which was many years ago now. <laughs> and, ago. and I still remember it because what, what was a... Well, it was a chat about books and about the festival, but what it turned into was then a much larger chat about music. <laughs> about Steely Dan, in, <laughs> in particular, I remember. <laughs> um, and then the, the friendship was born. Yes. Uh, yes. Oh, good old Harrogate. Well, we're mm. going to talk a lot about Harrogate, actually, over the next sort of half an hour or so. Uh, we want to talk about Crybaby as well, your latest novel, which has just been published. And of course, about your illustrious career. Um, so let's, uh, let's start with, with the new book, Crybaby. It's, it's a Tom Thorne novel, but it as many will know, it's a, a prequel to Sleepyhead, which was your first book published in 2001. So what made you want to write this one and go back even further before the original? Well, I suppose because it was a special book, because it was the 20th book, I was thinking, you know, it'd be nice to do something a bit different, something a bit special. Um, and, you know, just the idea of taking him back to a time when he was a different human. I mean, you know, he's a different person at the end of each book, I hope. Uh, he's always been a character I want to, you know, I want to have, you know, I want the reader needs to see that character change. We can't put these people through the, the things we put them through as crime writers and, and have them stay the same. That would just be a cartoon. Um, but I wanted to go back and, and see what had made him the character I put on the page in that first book. Um, it also gave me a chance to go back to a time that didn't have all this technology <laughs> that, that makes the life of a crime writer that much harder these days. You know, there isn't CCTV everywhere, um, virtually nowhere, in fact. Mobile phones absolutely in their infancy. Uh, internet barely exists. Uh, you know, the, the most technologically advanced thing uh, Tom Thorne has as a, as a detective sergeant, as he is then in the Metropolitan Police, is a pager. That's it. Not even, not even one with text. You know, one of, those, one of those ones that just beeps. And he's sitting somewhere and it beeps and he has to go and find a phone box, one that somebody hasn't weed in, um, and, you know, go, yes, D Detective Sergeant Thorne, you wanted me? And I... That is very attractive. That was a very attractive proposition to me. Yeah, because I've written I've written down here a few things that I noticed when reading because it's set in 1996. Yeah, shouldn't we? Um, and there's a there's reference to a flat in London now being worth 175k, yeah. um, and it just made as someone who lives in London uh, just yes. made me laugh. Well, St Thorne is still just married, <clears throat> uh, in the theoretically married, and he and his wife are talking about selling. The house, there, you know, and he's going. They reckon we, she reckons I could get 175,000 pounds for this house. That's ludicrous. You know, this is for a sort of three or four bedroomed house in North London. Uh, yeah, strange days. Yes, strange, yeah. You know, it, what is weird is though, even though it's a time I remember really well, you know, I mean, it's not like I was a child in 1996, I remember it really well. It still felt like it was a historical novel just because of all those references. You know, you used an A to Z if you wanted to get around and. You took you took a camera to you took a film to the chemists to have your photographs developed and you know look just just what was in the news back then you know Thorne turns on the TV and they're talking about mad cow disease and they're talking about take that splitting up and they're talking about you know and that and that was a joy to revisit you know sort of pop culture at that time as yeah. well yeah well because I I mean I, I hope you take this as a, as a as a compliment I sort of finished the novel singing Three Lions. <laughs> Um, you know, that was like, that was yeah. stuck in my head. Well, it does, that, that, that song does feature predominantly because the book takes place during the action of the of Euro 
96, which obviously Thorne is hugely looking forward to and hoping, hoping nothing distracts him. <laughs> and then along comes this, this, this horrible case. And in fact, the whole thing of the Euros was going to be kind of bookending the book because it start, you know, the book is set in 1996, so Euro 96 is just kicking off. And the very last chapter of the book was going to be set in the present day. Well, it still is set in the present day during Euros 2020. Uh, and that was written. But of course, then Euro 2020 was cancelled, yeah. along with almost everything else in the pandemic. So a very last minute rewrite. Uh, so, <laughs> give me the book back. I need to change the last chapter. <laughs> yeah, just quickly, quickly. Give me a couple of days. Yeah. Um, you, you just said you, you sort of loved going back to 96 in your head and, and that. Was there a moment, were there any moments when you were writing it that you were, you know, you just forgot yourself and you were writing things that would happen now and then you had to think, oh my God, no, that wouldn't be the case. Yeah, sort of. You, I did have to keep reminding myself every day where I was. Um, <laughs> maybe I should have dressed up in what I was wearing in the mid 90s every day. <laughs> uh, that, wouldn't have been, that wouldn't have been good for anybody. Um, I mean, music I, can help, can't it? To, to yeah. take you back to a place as well. Yes, although I've never, I've never really been able to, to listen to music while I work anyway, right. which is kind of annoying for someone, you know, for whom music is so important and music features in the book. But of course, what, what Thorne was listening to, it, it wasn't like Thorne was listening to, you know, whatever was big in the 90s. He wasn't listening to Fast Love by George Michael, although that does get a mention in the book. He's, he's, he's still listening to George Jones and Hank Williams. Of course he is, um, even though he's in his 30s. Um, but it was, it, was, it was great to go back in time. I needed, so, I needed a lot of help. I mean, I, on the one hand, I was thinking, oh, I won't have to do all this research. But of course, I had no idea what being a copper was like in, in the mid 90s in terms of, you know, how things worked. Also, what it was like in terms of the makeup of a squad back then, where things mm. were sort of sexual politics, you know, with uh, officers of colour, that kind of thing. Um, and I, I had the help of, a, of a, a wonderful bloke called Graham Bartlett, who's helped an awful lot of uh, crime writers. He's a writer himself, but he's an ex you know, detective who worked in the 90s. So he helped me out. At one point, he even sent me pictures of. Um, at one point quite early in the book, they're in a distant location and they have this kind of really early portable phone. Um, and he sent me a picture of it. And it's just bizarre. It's like this thing that, you, you know, you almost need two officers to carry. Huge lump of metal with a big curly wire. And so Thorne has a little rant about how these so-called mobile phones are use useless and they're never going to catch on. Because <laughs> <laughs> when I read that bit, I sort of pictured those those old movies from like the, well, probably from the 90s, maybe late 80s, where, where these squads like bring out the, the grey box and it's like a sat phone and there's all these bits that come out of it, you know, and they make yeah. the connection. But that's sort of what it was. It's wasn't it? Almost what it was. And, yeah. and, and on the few occasions Thorne has had to use one of these things, as Graham told me was, the, you know, the reality of it, they'd never be able to get a signal. You know, send for the portable phone. And everybody just go, <laughs> I've got nothing, Gov. I've got nothing. <laughs> so at the beginning of the, the novel, um, a young boy, a seven-year-old, goes missing in um, Highgate Woods. Can you tell us a little bit more about the story of Cry Baby? Well, the story is, it, it's, it's about sort of about two women, really. It's about two women who are very unlikely best friends from very different backgrounds. They live in very different parts of North London, uh, but they both have kids the same age and they bond at a kind of uh, baby and toddler group. Uh, and they become unlikely fast friends and they're sitting in Highgate Wood as they do every Saturday morning together watching their kids play in this playground which I know very well because it's where my kids used to play um, and you know they one of them goes to get a cup of tea and the other one sits watching the two kids and they run off into the woods and she's like careful you know don't go too far and only one only one of the boys comes back um, so this is a big you know missing persons case a big uh, what what they assume is then a child abduction case but then people around the case start to die adults start to die vaguely connected with i mean obviously connected but thorn quite can't quite figure out how they're connected and it becomes fairly obvious that that in order to find out what has happened to this boy he needs to solve these murders um and he does it with the help of uh a, a pathologist who he meets for the first time called Phil Hendricks. And that was, that was one of the joys of the book was to write their first meeting. Right. Yeah. I um, thought that, I thought that probably was a, a, a really exciting thing for you. That, to do. that was a chapter I was looking forward to. That was a <laughs> chapter I was looking forward to. Did you, did you, did you know what it was going to be like, or did you try a few different things? To, to I, get I it just right? kind of had uh, a very strong feeling that they wouldn't get on initially <laughs> okay but, yeah. but Hendrix would really rub Thorne up the wrong way which <laughs> which he does um 
by the end of the book, you can see the relationship they're going to have over the next 20 years. Uh, but that was fun. And I mean, it was fun putting in a few little sort of Easter eggs. I don't know whether you can call them Easter eggs when they're, they're clues to things that are going to happen. I suppose that, that counts as being an Easter egg. I think uh, so. You know, plenty of, plenty of characters that you'll know from the books do kind of move through the story, um, albeit as younger, younger people. You know, both Thorne's parents are still alive, and, I, and, I, and that was fun to write about because uh, I miss writing about, about Thorne's father. In Sleepyhead, Thorne's mother was already dead, but his father is alive for a bunch of the books, although he, he has Alzheimer's in those early books. And, mm. Although those, those, those scenes I really enjoyed writing, so it was fun to go back to when Thorne's father was not sick and you know all that stuff lots of treats i had yeah yeah exactly um and for us as well as readers you know and and i think people who are um who are who are fans and who have read all of the series are going to get a lot out of this book I hope did so. you um did you reread sleepyhead in order to write this no no, no okay. I, I, I probably I probably should have done, um, you know, and I should probably whenever I start a new book, I should probably reread what comes what has come before. So I don't make stupid mistakes. But I'm just I'm just too flipping lazy, Joe, I guess. Is the, <laughs> but have, no, having said that, I didn't actually have to read Sleepyhead because it because it wasn't that long ago. I'd had to read the whole book again for audio because I, I narrate all my own audio books. Yes. Yes. And I've, I've only been doing the later ones. So we've been going back. And I've been doing the audio versions of the uh, early books. So I had to go back not, not that long ago, probably only a couple of years ago, yeah. uh, and do Sleepyhead. And that's a really careful read, because I'm reading it over four days out loud in the, in the studio. <laughs> um, because there, and because there was a special uh, sort of, you know, uh, uh, edition of Sleepyhead published to tie in with this book, a big fancy thing with um, a new introduction by Lee Child. What, this thing? That, that very book there. Um, uh, I did a few little rewrites on Sleepyhead, which you know I'm not supposed. I'm, I'm not sure we were allowed to do. But I mean, who's are they say? subtle? Oh, they're very subtle. Okay. They're, it's a couple of little things um, because one of the things I've never done is describe Thorn. So I thought, hmm. except in Sleepyhead, where there's a couple of little, and I just said, why did I do that? Why did I do that? I've never done it since. I, I don't want to do it. It was just a stupid mistake I made uh, 20 books ago. So I quietly took those descriptions out. So they are not there in that lovely red book <laughs> that you just showed. And they're not there in any future, you know, uh, reissues of it. So, right. yeah, re rewriting my, you know, it's like a, di it's a director's cut, kind of. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's exactly, <laughs> exactly. We'll call it that. That's how that yeah. works. Um, when you started writing, um, London wasn't, as popular a setting as perhaps it is now in crime fr fiction. So what drew you to, to write about the capital, to set the book in the capital? Um, well, the first thing to say is it wasn't, as you say, a pop, and I was amazed at that. I thought there'd be, you know, dozens and dozens of, of crime series all set in London, but they, yeah. but they weren't, oddly. Um, I suppose the simple answer is it's, it's where I was living. Um, at the time I started trying to write a novel, I started trying to write one set in Birmingham, because that's where I'm from, uh, and found it really hard because I didn't live there anymore. It was, you know, there's something about writing about the streets you walk down. Yeah. And I was living in, you know, I was living in that part of London. And, I, and as you say, that territory wasn't occupied by, you know, I wasn't going to write a series set in Edinburgh. You know, I think, I think that had already been, uh, <laughs> that territory had already been claimed. Or, you know, there were, but, but to, to have a major city um, that, that, that didn't seem to have a serious detective, uh, you know, who'd claimed that, that territory. Also, the great thing about London in particular is the same, it's the same reason it's so good to write about Edinburgh or, you know, New York or any one of those big capitals is that there are two cities, you know, it, it, dozens of cities within that one city. Yeah. You know, put very simply, London is, you know, this tourist mecca and there's all sorts of a, there's a fabulous facade and it's kind of glamorous and exciting but you don't have to dig down too far be find before you find all sorts of of beastly stuff behind the curtain and <laughs> that makes it that makes it a joy to write about and there are pockets i mean people talk about pockets of london yeah. which is so true because each little borough and then even within the borough it has its own sort of climate if you like doesn't it? yeah and, and of course it's the most incredibly sort of you know ethnically uh, and socially diverse city you can think about um and and you know we've always said that about crime fiction is that 
you know, what makes crime fiction su such a perfect tool to, to look at the world is that your detective can go anywhere. Nobody can close the door in a detective's face. So Tom Thorne can be, you know, knocking on, on very fancy front doors in Kensington, you know, or in rather less fancy front doors in Hackney or, in, yeah. you know, wherever, in Camberwell, wherever he wants to go, wherever the, the murders take him, you know? Yeah. Well, Thorne wasn't meant to be the star of the show originally, was he? <laughs> no. no, he wasn't. He wasn't. I'd... I'd wanted to write a book where the victim was front and center. That was very important to me um, with that first book. I, it, it hadn't been that long before that, that I was a victim of violent crime myself. And I wanted to reflect that. I thought, yeah, I can write about that. I know what that feels like. Um, so the main character in this book in terms of, you know, in, in my head certainly was the victim, a young woman called Alison Willits, who spends the entire book, uh, as you know, in a, in a coma and she can't move and we're in inside her head. I needed a copper. I just, I knew I needed one for this book because there'd been a crime committed, you know? So I just went, oh, it's him. And just slapped him on the page, pretty much, and gave him a name, pretty much, without too much thinking about it. <laughs> um, and and off, off we went. And then, of course, when, when publishers, you know, thank God, wanted to publish Sleepyhead, and I had to go into these, what are called beauty contests. Um, these, these meetings at various, I was in the very fortunate position of a, of a number of publishers wanting the book, and I had to go and meet them all. So you attend what are called beauty contests, where you walk into a big fancy boardroom, and there's lots of fruit and muffins, <laughs> and you know, and, and dozens of people standing up telling you how great you are, and how, what a wonderful job they're gonna do with the book. But the first question they all asked was, is this the start of a series? It was the first question they all asked. And I went, absolutely. Yes, it is. Oh, God, yes, it is. I mean, what else am I going to say? I knew that was what they wanted. You know, it's like, it goes back to that thing of in a past life when I was an actor. If somebody says, can you ride a horse? You go, oh, yeah. Oh, of course I can. Can you play the trumpet? Oh, I'm brilliant at the trumpet. You say whatever you need to say to get the job, you know. Um, but at, at that time, the series was kind of the, the holy grail in terms of crime fiction publishing. That's what everybody wanted. Um, I think that's changed now, and that's a good thing. I think people are looking for all sorts of different things But back then. So, yeah, I knew I was going to have to write about Thorne again. And the fact that I hadn't put too much thought into him, I felt good about that. Yeah, I, I, I thought, well, I don't know who he is. I don't know where he's going to go. And I'm going to be discovering that at the same pace as the reader. And that's been the, my, my sort of working method ever since. Because that is, that is what's happened, as, as you already said, you know, in our chat. It's you, you and the reader discover a little bit more about him as the, as the books go on, which must be just, it just must be really great as, as the author to, it, to have that. It, it's great, but there are pitfalls. The pitfalls being, because I don't have a plan for him or a dossier on him, I get stuff wrong. I mean, at least, at least somewhere during that series of books, his eyes have changed colour. I mean, I know they, ha I know they have. Um, and I forget stuff. I mean, the, the Crybaby is a prime example. I'm taking him back in time and I'm suddenly going, wow, his mum's his mom's still alive. He's going to go and see his mum. How great is that? And I suddenly go, what's his mum's name? <laughs> I haven't got the first idea what his mum's name is. And I, I literally had to ask my wife. What was, was Thorne's mum's... You know, I should have a file somewhere on my computer that has all this biographical information, but I, but I don't, and I'm, I'm happy that way. Happy I, that. I love it. I just think, no, no, don't. Don't do that. Just, no. just carry on doing what you're doing. Yeah. Um, a quick note about Alison, uh, the character from uh, Sleepyhead. I remember, and I think it was, we were either talking about it at a, a, a Harrogate or something, but when that book came out, you said that actually readers really connected with Alison more than Thorne. Oh yeah. Book. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And I was very happy about that. Yeah. It was, it was. It was what I. It was what I wanted. And maybe, maybe Thorne wasn't fully fleshed out enough at that stage. I, and and that's one of the things. One of the questions I've been being asked uh, a lot recently because this is the twentieth book is you know why has Thorne you know why is Thorne popular after twenty books or how many books it is? And I think one of the reasons is that readers have put flesh on his bones. Re yeah. you know, readers know who he is even if I don't I mean I know obviously I know as much as they do but they're the ones that have the visual image of him and you know uh, I don't I don't see him when I write I don't I don't see David Morrissey who of course who of course played yeah. him um, on screen and and has played him again because uh, he's, he's playing him on the in the audio version of Crybaby which is a huge multi-voice you know, with like a dozen actors and stuff. And he's being, he's being Thorne again, which is great. But readers might see Thorne if they watched that TV adaptation in the same way that I couldn't read a Morse book without seeing John Thorpe. 
you know you do you do see kind of see actors but i don't so readers of the one that, that that have that have built the thorn character up in their head i'm delighted that alison willits resonated with people it's still um it's still something i'm very proud of what i did with that with her with that character yeah and do you do you think that maybe crybaby will find that a new audience maybe you know people who haven't read a thorn book before will come to it as the start of a series yeah well for, I, i've been getting a lot of emails recently from people saying oh this is a prequel to so should i start with this one or should i start with sleepy i haven't read anything you've written i've gone well, actually I'm, I'm not sure it really matters i've never i've never been i've never been one to say to people i'll oh, start with the i mean i'm i'm quite anal i, I always like to read a series in, in order if at all possible um because you you know you see a character develop yeah you don't have that thing of characters being dead then being alive again then but actually as as it is a prequel crybaby i guess is the perfect sort of entry point in a way um so yeah it would be it would be it's it's a pretty good place to start because I think there are there are some readers who just have to start at the beginning, you know, like you're saying. And, and I and there are others who will just go, oh, I'll pick up a Mark Billingham book and whatever. But, you know, the, the knowledge of there being an absolute start to something now, it does appeal, I think, to a lot of readers, especially crime fiction readers. Yeah, it does. Um, although the truth is, it's not how it's not how. I found, discovered the, the great series I enjoy. You know, I think, I think for example, the first Michael Connolly book I read was mm. The Poet, which I think is about his seventh book, uh, but it's a, and it's a standalone. And I read it and thought, this is fantastic. And then looked at the front and went, oh, there's loads of these. And then went back and started reading all the Harry Bosch series in order. You know, I'm sure the first Ian Rankin book I read wasn't Knots and Crosses. You know, uh, I don't think the first Val McDermott book I read was Mermaid Singing. You, you don't always accidentally discover the first book in a series. Mm. But when you discover that there is this history and you can go back, then I, then I have to read them all in order because I'm a bit nerdy like that. <laughs> was it hard not to write things we already know about Thorn when you were doing this? Did you slip into, you know, just, just the, the traits that we already know or things that had happened? And yeah, I, I, it was something I was constantly trying to remind myself not to do. Yeah. Um, and in a way, it's something I, I always do that. Whenever, you know, if I'm writing book 21, I'm, I'm never assuming that somebody reading it has read the previous 20. Right. Um, you, you have to do that because every book in a series has to stand on its own two feet. In fact, I mean, there used to be a thing where um, publishers with, with long running series would put, you know, uh, a so-and-so series, book 12. And they realised quite quickly that was a silly thing to do because readers would pick it up and go, book 12, I've not read the first 11, and put it back. Um, so they stopped doing that. But, I th <laughs> but every, every, book, every book has to work as a standalone. If you want to then go back and read the others, fantastic. Obviously, the writer's happy, the publisher's happy, everybody's happy. Um, but so I always... And you have to find a, an elegant way to do it. So in, I know, in the 17th Thorn novel, enter Phil Hendricks. Now, I've got to describe Phil Hendricks again, even though everybody that's read the books knows exactly what Phil Hendricks looks like. And they know, you know, they know all about the tattoos and the piercings and that he supports Arsenal and Thorn supports Spurs and they know all this stuff. But I have to presume the person reading this one doesn't. So you've got to find an elegant way to do it without going, you know, and here's the huge download of information about what Hendrix looks like. <laughs> and what. So yeah, that's a, that's a constant, that's a constant uh, problem that you face, but it's a good problem to have as a writer, just trying to find a new way to, to, to put this information in there. So no, I never, I never presume the reader knows too much about Thorne and certainly not with this book. And, and in this book very much, I was discovering things about Thorne. You know, <laughs> I really had to find what, what was he like in his thirties? What was he like when he passed out at Hendon as a, as a newly qualified constable, you know, all this kind of stuff. So it was yeah. a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. I've been speaking to quite a lot of authors um, recently and a lot have said, you know, lockdown hasn't been that much different for them because uh, you authors are used to spending a lot of time on your own in rooms, you know, in your pajamas. Um, in, in your pajamas. <laughs> uh, but a lot of people that has affected are musicians, and you and I know many musicians who haven't been able to tour. Mm. Um, and you yourself haven't been able to tour because. I spoke to, to Val, Val McDermott quite recently and she was saying, you know, the fun loving crime writers gigs all had to be cancelled yeah. like everything else. Um, and this is the, you know, the band that you're in, uh, if, if, if people don't know of it, that uh, has, has played Glastonbury. Yes. Um, but 
do you, have you been missing, you know, is that, is, did that feel a bit rubbish, yeah. not, not being able to go out and play music this summer? Yeah, well, it, it's two things, Joe. Yeah, I missed it enormously. Missed it enormously. But it's a first world problem. It really, really is. When you, when you, when you think about the way this lockdown has, has really affected an awful lot of people. Sure. I haven't lost my job. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not a, a single parent in a, in a, in a small flat with three young children, uh, and no income. I mean, really the fact that I couldn't do a couple of gigs, um, is, is a, is a very small problem in comparison. That said, I hated missing that stuff and I, and I hated all the live stuff, not just stuff with the band, but, you know, going out and doing, you know, the fact that we're having to do this instead of doing it in a, in a big room at, at the Harrogate crime writing festival um the fact that we won't be able to follow this up by going sitting in a corner somewhere with a with a drink and just yeah. chewing the fat and stuff um because for me writing is the job and all the other stuff is the perk uh, it, it's a perk i really really enjoy i've always enjoyed that stuff you know i have um because i'm from a performance background and i'm a big natural show off all that stuff is like, oh yeah what you want me to stand up and talk about this yeah i can do that i know plenty <laughs> of writers of course who would rather stick needles in their eyes because they, you know they're introverted i'm i'm not but so yeah i have really missed all that stuff um and the stuff with the band we had an, we had some really big shows lined up we had a whole sort of spring tour we had an amazing day at, at edinburgh which is just no point even talking about what we were going to be doing in edinburgh um but we, we will do it again we will do, do it again as soon as we as soon as we possibly can and um I, I have to say that, that again, unlike a lot of writers, I've spoken to a couple, but I, I got a lot of writing done during, during lockdown. I know plenty of people haven't, and I understand yeah. that. You know, you start going, oh, this is going to be a great crime novel. Oh, what's the point? We're all going to die. I, I can understand. No, but I can understand that sort of angst, you know, that kind of you read the news and you look at what's happening and suddenly you feel like, oh, this is all a bit trivial, isn't it? But I, I pretty much wrote the next novel, you know? Oh, wow. I, I think it's been a complete split, if I'm honest, from people I've spoken to who have found it the perfect time to be creative. And the other side of it is I just can't even concentrate. Mm. You know, not, I can't even read at the moment. No, exactly. And, and I think it is that. I don't think there's a, there ha, has been a, a, a middle. And it's interesting no. to, to speak to people who are on both sides of it. Um, well, you, meant, you mentioned missing literary festivals as well. And of course, we should talk about Harrogate, which is a wonderful place and a wonderful festival. And it's a festival that you have been associated with for, for a long time. Oh, yeah. No, by every single festival. I've been to every single festival. And uh, yeah, I've program, been lucky enough to program it a couple of times. And I'm on the committee now, the programming committee. And we had such an amazing lineup uh, for this year. Uh, for this very weekend um, but we will do it all again next year you know we will do it all again next year and the team that put it all together uh, that actually make our sort of you know fanciful ideas you know reality um, yeah. are just on it they are so on it and and it will all happen again next year and um, it, it's the biggest best crime festival in the world it's the first it's the first weekend we mark out in our diaries every year and the fact that we all know how to put a little red line through it is deeply deeply sad and I know I know that you know this very weekend when when this is being shown an awful lot of people are going to be hugely sad that they're not there but come back next year 2021 is the new 2020 that's what I've heard as well <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> but you I mean you've seen more than more than most then you've sort of seen the festival grow and change and you know become what it is and I recently spoke to all the authors who were long listed for the Thiexton's Old Peculiar Crime Novel of the Year award this year and each of them had you know great things to say about the festival but they all had you know lovely memories of it and I just wondered what some of yours were from you know from all of the years that you've attended. Uh, I mean, there are some events I remember very, uh, very fondly. Um, some events happen, uh, some of the best events happen with the least planning, just accidents happen. Uh, there was a year when a major special guest didn't make it, couldn't make it. There was flooding. I think there was flooding that, that summer and he couldn't make it. And literally we're all running around like chickens with our heads cut off going, we've got this massive event to put on like tomorrow. <laughs> He's not coming. What are we going to do? And the fact that everybody is there, you know, pretty much a cross section of all the best crime writers in the world. We just sort of went, okay, you and you and you and you and you. And we got sort of three American writers and three British writers. And we just went, right, USA versus UK. And of course the, 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 
the festival designed something brilliant. There were flags and it was just, and it turned into a fantastic event. One of the best events that whole weekend. I remember a, a, a wonderful event where uh, Ian Rankin and Peter Robertson both published their first books in the same year. And, uh, and it was a kind of anniversary of that. And we, you know, we put them both on stage and made it like a pub. So we just, instead of a big posh desk where they were both sitting, to, they both sat at a pub table with crisps and nuts. And we had a, a huge sign made that said the drinking detective, which is still there, which Harrogate still brings out every year for the festival. And I came on as a sort of barman with a sort <laughs> of, and I pulled them, pulled them both pints, put them on the table, said, Ian Rankin and Peter Robinson. And, off, and they just put the, sat and put the world to rights for an hour. And it was a fantastic fantastic event but you also remember you also remember the stupid stuff you remember you know the conversations you know late at night out on the grass or in the tent or you know some of the yeah some of the weird stuff perhaps some of the bad behavior which obviously i'm not going to talk about uh which occasionally happens mm. but you know you, you my memories of it are all good they are all all good um because they you know the one, the one thing that I think has always made it a great festival is that when we come to putting together the festival lineup every year, if somebody has come to that festival who's not behaved well, they're not coming back. Yeah. You know, basically, basically, life's too short for dicks. It's that simple. Whether <laughs> you know, no, I mean, really, really. Um, so we tend to just put people on who, who are nice and and sociable and entertaining, and so it's always a fun weekend. Always. And what I got from speaking to all 18 authors recently is that a bit like you were saying, you know, they spend so much time on their own that when it comes to Harrogate and, and other literary festivals, it's a time to actually, you know, talk to your mates and your colleagues and to, and to bounce things off each other and to sort of go, yeah, how are you know, am I, yes. I'm feeling this and you're, you know, and that, that must be something that's really missed in the in the writing community yes it is it's kind of like our AGM um yeah. but it's also one of those festivals that there is no velvet rope like you get a, you get a lot of festivals it's not like well all the writers are over here and all the readers are over there it's a chance when everybody just gets to to mingle usually in the bar obviously <laughs> um I probably should have said what are your what are your favorite memories of the Harrogate Grove? I should have said winning that award was <laughs> I probably should have said that, um, but actually, no, that was a lovely memory because when I when I won that award in two thousand, oh god, I wish I could remember uh, for for Lazy Bones, so for my third book, um, my kids were very little and the whole family were there, and it really did come to a point where my name got read out and my wife ran up to the room, um, and my I remember my son coming down in his pajamas and uh, running oh, into oh, the oh. room in his little green pajamas oh, with oh. planets on. I remember that. I remember that. Um, because that, you know, that award, has, that award has grown to become, you know, such an important, you know, there, there are two really important things. I think that the award is, is massive mm. um, and the New Blood panel is massive every year where Val McDermott selects, you know, four writers and she just spends all year reading kind of every new stuff. And that's a massive leg up to four new writers that basically says, you know, welcome, you know, it, it's a real seal of approval, really is. Oh, it is, isn't it? And, you know, the... The authors that have been on it that are on their third fourth fifth books now you know all think back to that moment they all mention it as yeah. a, you know as as yeah. when when they got the call to be asked yeah. to be on it and you know what that meant i do remember the um the story of her her asking um robert galbraith to come on the panel and you know th there being a sort of a polite no from the publisher and at the time no one knew it was jk rowling and and everyone being a bit like why is this Ooh, debut novelist get him, novelist? Get him. <laughs> because the, you don't turn this down no, if you're well debut. the odd thing about it is so these are brand new writers brand new writers whose first book have come out and they turn up to do this new blood event and suddenly they walk out and they're in this room of like i don't know 600 people on stage with val mcdermott looking at this huge crowd and do you know what? It's probably the best event they'll ever do. <laughs> it's kind of, well, it's all downhill from now. You know, cut to three years later, it's, you know, 14 people and a, and a dog in some tatty bookshop on, on, yeah. on the 25 like the rest of us. Joe Haddo's interviewing you. I mean, and, you know, yeah, you get, you'll end up with Joe Haddo. <laughs> um, so I want to just come back to uh, this massive achievement, which is your 20th book, because let's be honest, it's, You've had a great career, and I don't want to blow smoke, but you know it's it's an amazing achievement to be on your twentieth novel and to have created such a loved and brilliant character. Um, 
and of course next year will be the 20th anniversary yeah, I, won't it? strictly speaking yeah of yeah. of sleepyhead being published so are you you know hopefully the world will be a, a slightly different place and we'll be back in harrogate in july and are you planning a sort of bit of a anniversary celebration then oh yeah well i think oh, yeah. i think it's all going to be a bit a bit everybody will be coming becoming a bit at the end of lockdown like ah, it'll all go a bit crazy anyway but yeah no they, they, they'll be a party or two there will certainly be a party or two um and I, it's so weird when you talk about it joe in all seriousness in that it in my head, you know that way we don't feel the age we are. You know we don't. In my head, I'm still a young Turk. <laughs> in my head, I'm a, in my head, I'm like yeah, a bit of a maverick. You know, I'm still, I, I still do it. I'm like dad dancing. You know, I'm like, <laughs> I'm the crime writing equivalent of the sad dad at the disco who pulls a muscle, <laughs> trying to trying to trying to dance to some hip hop. Um, because I, I genuinely don't doesn't feel like that. I mean, it's been mm. a good year. Um, which is no great hardship if you write full time. Everybody says, oh, isn't that a terrible kind of treadmill to be? I mean, if you write in inverted commas popular fiction, it's a book a year. We all know that. Um, not just in crime, but in, you know, whatever other uh, subgenre you're in. Yeah. Um, and I'm very happy if I didn't have a book coming out, I wouldn't know what to do with myself. So every year I've, I've, I've written a book and they suddenly, and suddenly there's, there's 20 of them. And it just, it staggers me. It does. Um, uh, and I'm hugely grateful. It's the best job in the world, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah, of course. I mean, and especially as, because if I'm right in, in, in thinking, you were sort of interviewing, you, you were reading loads of crime fiction, interviewing authors, authors that are now, have, have since become friends and things. So yep. you were, you know, to, to look back now and go, wow, 20 books, you know, and and still thinking of yourself as being that younger guy. I, and in my head, I still, am, I still am that guy. I mean, um, this, this, uh, this very weekend, I'm also doing a, a, an in conversation with Ian Rankin about my book. And I, I'm gonna be spending most of that, every so often I'm gonna chat away, and every so often I'll go, that's Ian Rankin. <laughs> Because he, you know, he was one of the writers I interviewed. He was one of the writers I sat in an office shaking with a kind of dictaphone, asking Ian questions about his new book uh, for some magazine or other, just on the fringes of that world, trying to kind of, you know, and at the end I probably said something like, I've written a book, Ian. Um, I'm, I'm trying to be a crime writer. I'm sure I did. And I said the same thing to Michael Connolly. And I said the same. And as you say, now the fact that these are, these are pals is uh, I still occasionally have to pinch myself. But that's... I think that's a reflection of the fact that, that the crime fiction world is, is a pretty welcoming one. It is, you've seen that, you know that, it, it sort of is. And writers who are, you know, new kids on the block, five minutes later, they're, they're old soaks like me, you know. It's, <laughs> um, yeah, it happens, it's the way it happens, it's the way it should happen. <laughs> it is, it is, absolutely right. And you know, you mentioned, you mentioned that um, Ian Rankin memory, uh, you know, I noticed, in the anniversary edition of Sleephead that you, you were talking about earlier, this lovely red uh, novel that Lee Child does the, you know, the forward for it. I know. And you just, you go, wow, that's, that's Lee Child, but you know, he's your mate now and he loves your books. But it didn't take long. It didn't take long after my first book for me to realize, you know, without being, without being all schmaltzy about it, but just how nice most crime writers were. So literally you, go, you cut from that moment when I'm interviewing Ian Rankin as a sort of nervous young, to about, only about 18 months later, I am doing my first ever book signing in Edinburgh. I'm doing a, a stock signing at a stock and, I, and I'm sitting nervously on a, on a bench outside the shop because I've never done this before. I've never gone in and gone, hello, um, I'm, I'm the author, can I sign your stock? And I don't quite know what to do. And Ian Rankin walks past. I've not seen him since that moment that I'd, I'd interviewed him at his publishers. And he walks past and he goes, oh, hey, Mark, what are you doing here? Firstly, I'm staggered that he even remembers <laughs> who I am, right? And I go, oh, I'm, I, I'm doing a signing in there and I don't really know the right. And he goes, come with me. And he literally walked, and obviously they all know who he is. And he walks me in and he goes, oh, listen, everybody, this is Mark Bellingham. His first book's just come out. And he gets the stock off the shelves and he's opening <laughs> in for me to sign. And I'm just thinking, bloody hell. <laughs> You know, that's, that was just, I've never forgotten that was such a generous thing to do. Similarly, Lee Child, who was, who, who was Lee Child, for heaven's sake. You know, within, within a book or two, I'd met e, uh, Lee at things, and we, obviously we got, you know, we come from the same city, and we, although we support different football teams, but we sort of bonded, and suddenly, you know, I'm doing events with Lee, and he very generously would, you know, did this forward. People are nice. People are just pretty nice as a rule. 
Yeah. Good, isn't it? Yeah, it's good, good isn't it? Uh, and you get that from, from Harrogate as well. Where, you know, after you spent a weekend at Harrogate, you come away and go, well, that was nice, wasn't it? Yeah, that yeah. Well, plenty. Nice I, I think that goes for readers too, because a lot of readers are a little bit nervous, maybe. They know about this festival and they go, God, I love crime fiction. I'd really like to go, but maybe I haven't got anybody to go with, you know. Uh, but they go and they will come away with a dozen new friends. You know, they will come away the next year they'll have dozens of people to go with so absolutely um yeah a dozen new friends and a dozen new books oh at least a dozen <laughs> new books suitcase full of books yeah um well it's been absolutely lovely to catch up with you to have a, to have a yes, chat and just to see too. you um and crybaby is published by little brown it's out now just yes come out, it is it? yes it is and it, it was so enjoyable mark to read it thank and, you um you know I, I hope it does really well and an amazing achievement and here's to your 20th anniversary next year when we can be out on that lawn with a pint yes. in hand. Let's hope for good weather and fine beer. <laughs> it's lovely to see you. Thanks. You thanks too, so Joe. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. If you have enjoyed this event as part of the Harrogate International Festivals, please do think about a donation to ensure that our festivals can survive in the future. Donations can be made by texting HIF and the amount to 70085. For more events, please visit our online hub, The Hiff Player. It's packed with upcoming live streams, events you've missed, archive recordings, and much more. sound.com